I didn't want to stay poor. I want to become rich. It's just so obvious if you go through the eyes of the shopper. Can we do it quicker? Can we do it easier? Do we have to do it at all? <clears throat> this is stupid. This is offensive. And I'm trying to help you here. Yeah. In this episode, I spend time with Neville Wright. Neville Wright left school at 15. His dyslexic was called a dummy. Despite that, he built a business from nothing to 200 million pound net worth. Learn from Neville. He's got some great advice, some great wisdom. And I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Welcome to another session of Success is a System. I'm really uh, uh, humbled and honoured to be here with Neville today. Neville, Neville's a friend, but I, I respect him massively for what he's achieved in business. Uh, and literally from, from nothing and lots of reasons why he shouldn't succeed, couldn't succeed, wouldn't succeed, but still built a multi-hundred million pound business. Uh, where do I start? Uh, the the uh, dyslexia and the ADHD has been absolutely fantastic for me, although I didn't realise this when I was young because you, you don't realise what you've got and, and, until you understand uh, a, a bit about yourself and uh, life, etc. Yeah, so um, it's been really, really good and the systems are really uh, ingrained because of the ADHD, because of the dyslexia, so you automatically make systems because you can't cope really uh, with everyday uh, situations. So it's like, uh, if, for a start, if you want something, you know, you make your goals. So we wanted the basic things, we wanted enough to eat, we wanted a, uh, a house um, and every, I think every girl, especially girls, they, um, uh, it's a bit of controversy now <laughs> saying girls, isn't it? But you know, the girls uh, want a house and they would love to have it paid for. They want security. Well, this is Marilyn. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm categorizing like girls as... But I think the reality is we all want those yeah. things, don't yeah. we? Yeah, so, so you want security. You, you want to know that uh, you're not going to starve and, and things like that. So you have to have a system. And, uh, and with, with uh, going into business, I couldn't do a lot of things. I could organize. I know what I wanted. And I could speak to people, customers, and... And so I knew the concept of business, but I couldn't do like the book work. I knew if it was right or wrong, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. wanted somebody who would sit down and do the books on a daily basis. Well, I couldn't sit down for more than a few minutes. Um, that's one thing. So I, the system was get somebody to do it. Who could I, focus. Who and... focus, yeah. And, uh, uh, and with my dyslexia, I couldn't write because I didn't know where the letters mm. went. So um, those were the things which was great because you have to employ people. But what I find amazing, even in that, that sort of start to the answer of that question is, you say it was fantastic, it was great. So many people see it as an anchor, a reason why they're going to be held back or held in place. But what you're saying is yeah. it was it was a challenge, but it made you create coping mechanism systems uh, to overcome that challenge. Yeah. I used to I used to have a job. I had 17 jobs and it was all true about people who say job is just over broke. Right. And I was always just over well just always under broke. broke. <laughs> always just under broke. All the time just under you know trying to survive. So therefore when I my ambition was uh, to survive uh, and, and to have a nice life and then really underneath which I didn't believe at all underneath I wanted to be rich yeah well why yeah. shouldn't I some people were and I wasn't so I was going to work in overall and when did that start was that like even as a kid you had that kind of entrepreneurial I, or desire to be rich yeah I couldn't understand how anybody could be dressed like you are in a suit and make money because I came from a working class okay. family who I only saw people in overalls. So you thought it had to be manual oh, to... And I thought there is no way you can earn money unless you are grafting with a pair of overalls getting dirty. Right. Right? And I could... And I had this thing about <clears throat> people who wore suits. What were they doing? Because you can't see 
what they're doing because they're yeah. using their brain in other words you know and they're using stuff skills that i hadn't got which was writing and and things like that so therefore there was this void in between how do i get from here to here with my abilities and so my goals inside me wanted to become rich yeah, yeah, yeah and the only way i could do that and i was willing to take that chance because i didn't want to stay poor I want to become rich, and, and if I stayed where I was, coping with what I'd got, I would always be where I was. Just over broke. Yeah, just over broke. So therefore, it didn't matter. I'd take a chance, whatever chance it was in employing people. You had nothing to lose at I've that point. I've got nothing yeah. to lose, mm-hmm. not anything to lose, because I could always go back to broke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I burnt my bridges on the, 20, uh, the, the 26th of September, 1974, when I come out of that dole office with zero, and I burnt my bridges, br- bridges, my, I said my bridges. I, I, remember you say, I remember you saying you were, <laughs> Only asking for an extra two pounds to be able to cover your yeah. costs a week. Yeah, know? that's right. Uh, and yeah, and, and realizing that they wouldn't and couldn't no. help you. They said they would, but they said I have to give something uh, back to society, and that was another baby. So if I had another baby, You'd I'd have get, more costs. I'd get more points, and I'd get two pound a week. I couldn't even afford to feed the one that I'd got, let alone mm. have another one. And that's the tipping. Everybody has a tipping point where they go. Whatever I do can't be as bad as what I've got at the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. So therefore, going forward, realizing that um, I, I couldn't do any worse, but I did realize yeah. on the first day of being a window cleaner, I realized on the first day I got less than I got on the doll. So, and you so, could only clean so many windows in it. Yeah, <laughs> so therefore it was another spur because did I want to open those doors at that doll office and the guy said, oh, hello Neville, I knew you'd be back. Come on in, you yeah. loser. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So therefore, you know, you burn your bridges and you, you prove to yourself, you know, and that takes a long but time. E- but even in that, it's interesting because obviously... Uh, I've mentored over the time and, and I'm a, every day every day's a school day kind of thing so I'm always trying to learn and listen but it does seem to me and I've heard it said that we're pushed more by our fears than we are pulled by our dreams and it's like I can't stay here yeah. and I want to go there but I want to go there because I don't want to be here yeah. so yeah. The, people think of motivation as being somewhat positive but it, it's also sometimes the negative it that drives negative. you and pushes you kind it of is thing. a negative that uh, where are you going to get the next meal from? You know, uh, can you afford to buy any 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 new shoes or whatever? You know, you, and it, and you can't, and that's and that's you know that's a negative yeah. that drives you yeah. forward. And and then you one of the great things was Muhammad Ali. You know, he's been a hero of mine. If you look on my website, you'll see him, met him as a mentor, yeah. and um, he wasn't afraid of of anything. He knew that uh, you know he was going to. He was going to win or lose the fights, and whether he lost the fight, he, if he lost the fight, he didn't say, "Well, I'm packing this in because no, I'm no, no good at boxing." He you know, it's just that he hadn't done enough training, and uh, he used to count his uh, reps when uh, when it was when it was uh, time to give up, yeah, when yeah, it was hurting yeah. him. And he said, uh, if he wasn't a boxer, he could be the world, instead of the world champion boxer, if he wasn't that, he could be the world champion garbage collector. And I think I've heard that because he says something like, it's not the 10 reps you can do that grow you, it's, it's the ones beyond yeah. what you can do yeah. that are gonna strengthen. And I, I thought, so a world champion person coming down to my level saying, uh, I would be the best garbage collector, change my world. Yeah, yeah. I could be the best painter, I could be the best window cleaner, I could be the best roofer, I could be the best at anything I did. And then you have to realize that you can only do so much being a practical person, doing any of those things. There's a ceiling yeah, to yeah. anything. So you need more people because if your goal is to be rich, so, you need more people to but help. But where did you find this in, because, um, where, uh, from my point of view, when I was, when after I, Jules and I lost everything and we're delivering pizzas on mopeds and everything, trying to, trying to make it back, there was no internet. So I couldn't no. Google anything. No. It, it just could. wasn't there. I had to go to the library yes. and I had to yeah. take books out. Yeah. But I mean, in a way, because of your dyslexia, that would have been, that would have still been harder for you than me <laughs> because reading what? must have really been hard. Yeah. So, so where did you get, where did you pick up that Muhammad Ali or, or other inspiration? Yeah, well, this was, that, that was on the radio. Oh, okay. That was. So you, 
heard things on the radio. Um, uh, I used to um, have books, but pictures were good for me. Um, my dad gave me some uh, encyclopedias. Okay. Uh, uh, so he was dyslexic as well. But these these building encyclopedias had uh, a lot of um, practical stuff like drawings, technical drawings. And, you could get that, and I could understand yeah. those, how to build a roof, for instance, you know, how to put a dormer on, how to whatever. Yeah. You could, I could read the pictures. Yeah. Well, and, and I now mentor um, five or six guys who um, ha- suffer with dyslexia as well, but Audible has been a lifesaver for them because yeah. they can get most of the books in the world on, on Audible. Yes. And there's even apps now that you can scan a book and it will yeah. read it. You get my book on Audible. 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 I think that's on Audible yeah. now. So. Yeah, and, then, oh, and that, what, that's 37p to 100 million, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the answer is yes. Now, what is the question? I'll show you yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but the, but the, 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 uh, the great thing is, uh, I get people saying, I listened to your book. I've, I had like uh, four hours to go somewhere and I listened to your book and I was four hours in and actually I stopped in the car park all day listening to, listen listen to your book. Oh, right. Yeah. So um, Did you do the Audible on it? Or no, right? I didn't. I couldn't because can you imagine me and I'm reading my book and I say, oh, that just reminds me. I'll tell yeah, you a story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll make sure we put the link uh, yeah. link on the book uh, for it and we'll show a picture of it uh, uh, in, in, in this feed. But So um, but before we uh, started today, we were just chatting as we always do and it like time, time goes before, and then we realise we're not, not actually going on. But one of the systems you said about is as you were building business, that focus was tough as well. So you'd do what? 20 minutes in one department, 20 minutes, and that yeah. way you, you could give everyone. And, that, and the positive to that, as you were saying it, I thought, is it probably meant you interacted with every department. Now, you were yeah. doing it because you couldn't focus for more than 20 minutes, yeah. but it meant that you spent time with everybody I'd, within a day. Yeah, I did. I couldn't sit at a desk. In fact, on our first uh, first. Uh, shop we didn't have an office that was at home the second shop uh, there was only enough room for three people so we had two single toilets in this shop uh, the second shop so we took one toilet out we took the door off we we put it across and that was the that was the desk so three people worked <laughs> in what is a single cubicle toilet <laughs> on stools yeah uh, on the desk so I never had one then uh, I never had an office in the third uh, oh crikey so in the fourth shop there was a big office and Marilyn was going to be in there and I was going to be in there and there were some set tees like this and they said where do you want your desk and I said I do not want a desk because I can't I, I can only do 20 minutes right. and then my mind unless unless there's an hour's job in the warehouse and I focus with six of the people because I I do my best work mm-hmm. when I'm in a team and I'm organizing the team and I do my best work when it's physical you know so so therefore I didn't have a, a, an office yeah, yeah, yeah. really because it bore me to tears so uh, in the in from the fourth or fifth shot to the sixth or seventh shot I um I used to go around 20 minutes 20 minutes in the uh, accounts department 20 minutes in the video uh, department 20 minutes in the restaurant 20 minutes you know in the kitchen I used to do two 20 minutes 20 minutes in the morning we used to be making breakfast uh and we've got 100, 125 staff So we fed them three times a day and then we had all the customers that we used to feed and I used to go in 20 minutes at night when it was shut and uh, filter the oil because, you know, there's a goal within a goal. You can throw 25 litres of oil away like a lot of places do and go back or you can spend £1,500 on a filter and you filter them, but it's got to be done properly, you know, and it was like magic. There was a system and it was... Everything had a system. Every, we ended up with like 40 people in the offices. Every desk had all what they needed. Every, you know, whether it was a, a pens or whether it was sellotape, whatever they needed on that desk. Because if somebody got up to go to the next desk to borrow a tape measure or something, then it was cheaper to buy a tape measure to put on that desk yeah. than them walking across there. Yeah. If they wanted to walk across to the other desk for some knowledge or some training or something that to help the customer, 
That was fine. I, I love that movie, The The Founder, which is about Ray Kroc when he bought the McDonald's stores and then uh, built it into McDonald's. And literally, the efficiency, they would draw out on the car park yeah. the layout yeah. of the McDonald's store to make sure that they could have the most efficient uh, transition, if, if yeah. you like, of the product yeah. through. But one of, the, one of the, I mean, there's so much that goes through my head as you're talking, because what, what's really clear is, I mean, you, you, you've got a, a strong nine-figure net worth now, which is incredible. Yeah. For, I mean, for anybody, uh, let alone million, the uh, 2011, uh, there was 100 million. We're at 10 or 11 years on now. <laughs> and then, so that's what I mean. It's, strong, it's, it's well beyond that. But still, and you were saying earlier, uh, a couple of days ago, you're up in a loft putting, um, yeah. uh, put, putting in the insulation. Yeah. So yeah. It, being hands on has obviously always been so, and touching. <clears throat> and interacting with every part of the business, but is it still important to you to get physically yeah, involved? Yeah, it is. It is, because I knew <clears throat> that I'd got to crawl underneath air conditioners. I knew it'd be hard, and I know if you stop physically working with your body, in, uh, you can go and do weights, or you can go and do some exercises, but can I crawl <clears throat> uh, flat? Can I wriggle under those air conditioners? I, I, can, I wanted yeah, to do it, yeah, just yeah. prove to myself. And I want some exercise that day. I want to still know that I can do it. So I'm, I'm, it's like a bit uh, mean, really. I'm, I'm doing it for myself. Right, right. But well, but that's a great way to turn it from oh god, I've got to do this insulation yeah, and I think it's but brilliant. to being actually this is good for me. Yeah, you know? it is. It is. And, and I don't mind me saying, but seventy-two years old, got the energy of a twenty-two-year-old, in fact, perhaps yeah. more than some twenty-two-year-olds. So it does seem to me that you know part of the reason for talking about systems uh, success as a system is you've got a system for your health, you've got a system for your wealth, you've got a system for your business, yeah. uh, and and everything just is about understanding how to be. Uh, the happiest and most effective at what you do. Yeah, I I do uh, most of my time is spent mentoring now, and people ask me to go and have a look around their shop. For instance, I say, okay, I'll meet you across the road. What? Why? Because you start outside. Right, you start outside. What does it look like when you come in down the street? Mm-hmm. So I'll walk. 500 yards down the street and I want to know what that shop looks like is it attracting me Mm -hmm. I'll go past 500 yards and I'll walk back what does it look like on this side of the street what does it look like on that side of the street and then then you look at the uh, 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 the shop and you can go there say at 9 o'clock um as somebody, you know, is there a bar, restaurants about, you know, do people, uh, are they sick at night? Has the person got somebody to wash the, wash the windows before the people come in? And that's before you even think about yeah, going inside. Uh, before you think about it, is the paint all chipped? Is it dirty? Has a dog been pissing up the, uh, the door? Is there a yeah, has it been cleaned? It? Is there a... Uh, it, is the gutter outside your shop clean? Is the yeah, yeah. is the pavement? And what I get is, well, the road sweeper comes along. I don't care about the road sweeper, but I am responsible. The fish stinks from the head down. If I own yeah. that shop, I'm responsible for what it looks like outside. Is Incredible. it chewing gum all over the pavement? Yeah, yeah. You know, get it off. You know, and it's things like this that stop you know, we, people going in or, you know. We've or, got different but very similar backgrounds in that respect. So two thirds of my career was retail, retail advisory, literally all around from anything from St. Tesco, Asda Morrison's down to spa, budgins, Londis, uh, and, and uh, all, all of those in between, mostly food and drink though. But exactly the same. So I would say walking down the street, they've got the most beautiful shop front, let's say, but people don't see it side on. So have you got yeah. have you got a, 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 a sign that's coming out this way? This so I interact this yeah, way. Yeah, this is just um, a while go down the street. Yeah, and then similarly, you're talking about in the evenings. What I'd say is, you know, you shut for more, some of them shut for more hours than you're open. Yeah. If it doesn't move, it won't be seen. Why well, haven't you got a screen in there that's moving that's going to catch their eye, that's going to make them look in? Exactly. It's this funnel. That if you don't get them at the top of that funnel, they're definitely not dropping out yeah. the bottom of it. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we suck them in from the street. The shop window gets them excited. They open the door. Yeah. When they open the door, do they get a welcome? When they get the welcome, do, do they then see some products and promotions, the right price, isn't it? Yeah. It's just so obvious if you walk that journey and go through the eyes of the shopper yeah. or the potential shopper, 
Yeah. But so many don't do it. They come in the back door of their shop because they park out back. Yeah. They never even look out front. Yeah. So um, there's, there's there's two things uh, I, I focus on. First, what's the presentation like for and and what's the street scene like and everything else. And then I was in London a few weeks ago uh, mentoring, and um, the guy's got a shop, really really nice shop from the front, and he says, "Come in." I said, "No, I'm not coming in first. Uh, show me where the back entrance is." what do you want to go down there for? I go, well, you'll find out if you come yeah. with me. And I looked and I said, what a shithole. Oh. What a shit. And, and it's, well, you know, this, uh, and, and it's not all my, Is that's not my mattress. You know, that's the next door neighbours who's thrown that out. You know, and it's things it's like still this. a reflection yeah. on his business. It's a reflection on your business. It's a reflection. Your staff see it. Your staff get complacent. Yeah. You know, there's got to be a system for getting rid of the waste. Why is it over... Flowing. Well, the people haven't come to empty it. Okay, so why don't you get them on a certain day? Well, it's not always full on that. It's always someone else's fault. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and so we go around and we're seeing what the thoughts of the tenants are, you know, what the thoughts of everybody down there. And you've got to do something about it because your responsibility. That's before you. And yeah, even 20 years ago, when I first started looking more into food service rather than traditional food and drink retail, McDonald's were walking a Hundred yards each way from yeah. their shop, doing litter box. Oh, well, they were picking up. Yeah, they picking were picking litter, up the yeah, government. Yeah. And now people want to say how terrible they are, but as a business, it is kind of it yeah. focuses on everything. So I've said in uh, I think one of my talks a uh, few few weeks ago that uh, I probably use more um, GPO green paint than they did because if there was a GPO box uh, down the road with graffiti on. I don't care if it's outside my shop or outside somebody else's shop. I will go and clean it and I'll go and paint it. And the next day if somebody's graffitied it, I'll go and paint it again yeah, because yeah. They, f- they get fed up. You know, the graffiti artists go, oh, I've gone somewhere else where they but, don't, you know. But, and I guess if that's a system, what, what you're doing is you're, you're – um, focusing each day to see your business as a customer would see your business, yes, aren't you? Yeah. And, and yet so many people, when I say to, tell me about your customers, oh, I'll be all right if I didn't have any bloody customers. <laughs> you know? and, but how many staff, especially the, the ones serving, their job only exists because of the customers and yet they yeah. say, fucking customers, yeah. or they're a pain in the arse, yeah. or we have to, you know, they're never happy. And you think, I now know why you're perhaps not doing as well as you could. Yeah. Or would yeah. or should. You know. People people say, how the hell did you get a 70 million, uh, which is a world record for a, uh, for a single unit, for a single unit, and it wasn't even a limited company. It was just Marilyn and I, mm. and then and and it was so they couldn't they they really couldn't <clears> cope <throat> when it comes to signing up. They go. Is, well, we had to make it limited for about three or four hours mm-hmm. before we could sell it. So it's like, that must have been probably one of the biggest multiples yeah. of retail. Uh, yeah, it, it uh, was. It's a, it's a world record price for that a type of shop yeah, uh, yeah. in that category. So how did you come up with the price? Because uh, yesterday I did a session with um, Oliver Woolley from Investors and we were talking about how to value so we're startups trying to get money through to business trying to sell. I spoke to Ian Brent of Fladgate. Uh, at the value Valuation is quite subjective, yeah. but I guess if you're selling, you, it's got to be enough, otherwise you're not going to sell it. Yeah. But how did you come to that value? Or, um, or so, know, so did you just keep saying no till? Yeah, yeah. We've got seven offers of uh, of seventy million, right. uh, and one of more which we rejected because they would have just closed the business. It would. But uh, people say, how did you how did you get that? And I go, okay, so systems. You got it by systems, consistent system. So when that gate opened uh, in the morning and people started coming in and they went and parked the car, they never thought to themselves, oh, look at that pile of rubbish. They never saw the guard. I spent uh, it was always £100,000 on the plants around the car park. Yeah, yeah, in there. Yeah. So there would be not a speck of litter. There would be not a cigarette end. There would yeah, be yeah. no... So people never thought about that. But it was it was always spotless. And I remember yeah. um, coming up when we had our first daughter. Now, five generations of my family have, have lived in Peterborough. But at the time, Jules and I were living down in Bedfordshire. We still drove up because you did a thing where you'd cover the petrol, petrol if we yeah. came up. Yeah. But we came up and the thing that really stood out, we think, oh, what do we need? So there's someone to help you with what you might need kind of thing. Uh, and we got a, uh, a car seat and um, 
I don't know if it's there, I will say, Mother Care never showed us how to put yeah. a car seat in. Yeah. Halfords do it now and they do, do show. But they didn't do your it guys would say, let me show you how that works. Yeah. Kind of thing. And, and they'd come out. And because you, you, you don't, I mean, no lessons on how to, how to be a parent or have a baby, but then all the stuff that goes, well, yeah. the hell is this? But I, your guys would come out and show us yeah, all. Yeah, I was the first car seat fitter in England. Yeah. I believe I was, because in those days you had to drill, you had to take the back seat out, you had to drill two holes, you had to put the bolt in and it was a and the only seat on the market that you could bolt <laughs> in in 1977 was something called a securon and Marilyn uh, we, we was lucky enough to have a, a bus stop yeah, outside yeah. our sh- first shop and Marilyn used to keep an eye one in Warrington uh, on, no the one mm. in Borges Boulevard the first oh, okay. one okay so I used to drill the holes right and then I had to used to get under the car right so I had a pair of overalls I put on and and uh, Mar- I used to hold the nut on the bolt, and Marilyn used to do, do do it up until it was tight in the back of the car, looking at the shop to see if any customers was going in. And so that's yeah. how we started. People forget how hard <laughs> you and Marilyn have worked. I know with Jules and I, you know, you say, "Oh yeah, do you realise that we were driving mopeds?" Yeah. You know, and so and and I remember once Julia had never driven the moped and she went to go on it and literally drove straight into the shop next door through a plate glass window on the glass wall. But but you just did what you needed yeah. to do. Yeah. And and it's interesting because I see a lot of young entrepreneurs these days think, oh I need I need a, 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 a handmade suit before I can start. I need a better car. I've got to have a flash office. I need a MacBook. Yeah. I need you know and you, you started with, with you know, can I get a better paintbrush or yeah. or, or or using the toilet for three of stuff the being and stuff like that yeah so this was the systems that you had so i didn't want anybody to come through that gate and say oh look somebody's left the mcdonald's or somebody you know it was always tight couldn't they talk and then you went through the doors that opened because if you'd got a push chair or a pram you didn't want to go and try and reach so the automatic doors so people going in there didn't have to open it. It didn't have to touch the door, open it. And then the first thing in that last shop that you saw, we had toilets in every shop, but the first thing you saw uh, is toilets. Yeah. And you and you. And there was music in yeah, there. Male, was, male and female. Like I don't want to go in the toilet and listen to other people. So we had music in there. Yeah. So I didn't want to touch a toilet door. I still don't, you know. And but so we had corridors going round, yeah. it, round. So I you remember. couldn't see in, but you could go round without touching a door. We had sinks, which was a small sink for the children and a large sink. Yeah. And we had uh, uh, um, so heat sensors. So you couldn't. So it was only like. So you weren't copying degrees. others. You were. You no. were. Walking degrees. the walk of a customer yeah. to understand how. It if you be went into our uh, restaurant, you've got a little sink there and a big sink. And because yeah. one thing I hate is going into a restaurant and going, I want to wash my hands, and then you go into the toilets and you spend two minutes in the toilet or thirty seconds in the toilet washing your hands, and then you come out and people think, oh, he's been to the toilet and not washed his hands. But all you've done is gone in and washed your hands. Right, right, so right, right. I didn't want that thought going people through people's minds. So the sinks were in the entrance of the so restaurant. Uh, okay. So you can go, you got, you know, if you're having uh, starters and it's sticky or whatever, you just got to rinse your hands. Yeah. Done. But people could see it happening as well, yeah, and there's that yeah. that, that, that awareness yeah. of hygiene. I didn't want to go in, I mm-hmm. never want to go into a restaurant toilet and meet the chef peeing in the next urinal, yeah, right? Yeah. So our, our, all of our 10 people who worked in the restaurant had their own toilets. But you've taken that level of detail into every business say, or property yeah. or, or, you know, commercial property, residential property, everything you've done, you do to that. Degree. You stand still, stand still all the time. Yeah. And you look, uh, people go, Oh, all the, all the time people go, it's all right for you. You're a multimillionaire. You wouldn't have to, you know, like people that uh, rent properties office or yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, commercial, you wouldn't do what I have to do. I go, what? Pick up rubbish. Yeah. Look at your, look at your litter that's in there. Now I got that from going to Disney. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Disney was is great. They have systems and they have people going around with dustpans and brushes. And this was in the 1980s. So I came back because in the 90, early 1980s, if you went into a clothing shop, it didn't matter anyone in, in England, you'd see by the afternoon, there was dresses on the floor, there was tickets, there was labels, there was rubbish all over. And then they used to clear up at night. From that day onwards, 
there would be nothing on the floor. There'd be no tickets. Yeah. People would be going around uh, sweeping up all day. Yeah, yeah. I, lo- you know? I love Disney. I went to uh, some some um, things with Disney University, and and one of those things was uh, some great examples. Like they would roll um, in Frontierland, for instance, the level of detail. They would while the concrete was set, and they would roll carts through uh, yeah. to create the yeah. cart tracks. Yeah. and and it's because Disney said. I want it to be so experiential back to what it was like to be in a, yeah. a cowboy town. Yeah. It's amazing what you can feel with your feet. Yes. You would say. And so and then he'd say, like, we want to create magic moments. Every one of the cast, as they called them, not staff, every one of the cast, because we're putting on a show for people, um, is targeted with creating a magic moment for customers. Now, if you're Mickey Mouse in a in a Mickey Mouse suit, it's amazing how you can create a magic moment. It's obvious. Yeah. But they, I love the example of a cleaner uh, in one of the hotels. And w- when he created these magic moments they would reward people for it but then they would learn from it and apply it across the the the, all of the sites and all of their hotels and the example i love was a family had been staying in a hotel room for a couple of days and they bought a mickey and a minnie and a donald and the date the little characters and they're on the bed so the the cleaner does her bit and then what she does is she in a a little tub chair that's in in the room she lines up mickey minnie donald daisy whatever turns on the disney channel and, and, and they're watching the Disney Channel. Now, you imagine what it's yeah. like for those kids coming back and yeah. then the parents seeing those kids coming back and all these little Disney characters are watching the Disney Channel. What a magic moment. Yeah. But that could be replicated across every room. It won't be any less special for any family that experiences that. Yeah. It costs nothing. That, that lady who did it got the reward. Um, and then every customer there on gets that magic moment. Yes because they're focusing on show us how we can make better customer yeah. better customer experience yeah. show us what we can do differently better best all the time when people was queuing up for their goods there would inevitably be a wait and we used to have a a, a, a television screen showing them where their goods are yeah. and coming down four floors and, uh, and and what we did we we got a parcel basically and put a camera on set it running from the fourth <coughs> floor down the next and next and next and coming on the conveyor belt and you'd see coming through the wall the, the products coming through the wall yeah. and so they were fascinated to see behind this wall there was four floors of picking yeah, yeah there was yeah. and there and so it kept them but even while they were waiting they knew that it wasn't like nobody was interested they knew it was all happening yeah. towards them. and it kept them it kept them amused so the time went quicker if they didn't want to go down to the uh, tills there's always a queue and we've got six tills and there's always queues up there um they would we've got 30 kiosks where they was taken and they put the credit card in and the and the yeah. girls and the lads used to put their stuff stuff in and as there was entering their pram and they'd go oh did you want that pack which has got uh, your accessories in? And they go, oh, yes. Yeah. So, so they put the pack in. Or did you want the mattress? Yeah, you'll need the So mattress. upselling, but not pressure selling. There was, selling, there was so upselling they... because there was going through each of the items the customer had picked and there was reminded themselves and the customer, oh, you didn't get your yeah. waterproof sheets. Right, okay. And you didn't get this and didn't get that. You will need them because it's no point in yeah, having yeah. the baby and... Uh, and then the next day, come and they, oh, you didn't tell me about the waterproof but, sheet. We but no one gives you that advice. So it oh. wasn't, I, I remember literally experiencing it just as a customer before I ever knew you. And it was like, oh, thank God. And it was, so it wasn't like, oh, they're flogging me extra stuff. No. It was, oh, shit, I hadn't thought about that. No, it and it was, a, it was actually a, an advisory, a yeah. consultancy, yeah. an education, yeah. as well as, uh, as being able to buy. They, they, they were taught to, right, so this is how we taught people. New people come along and we'd stand a few metres from the door and you'd see hundreds of people come through the door. Um, tell me what a person wants. And they go, oh, I don't know, a cot. Uh, tell me what this person wants. It's going to have pram. Tell me what this person wants. Come uh, And they go on and go, no, 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 no. They, all they're looking for is a salesperson to help to sell them what they want. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what they need, you know, and but and not every, sell them stuff they don't want. Exactly, you, exactly. Know. This is where they come to car seat fitting. We had six car seat fitters full time, and I would be fanatical. You 
only will you'll fit the car seat. If it doesn't fit, you will not sell the customer that car seat. I don't care how much money we're making, you will not, you'll find something that fits Great. properly, the nearest to what they uh, want. But if it comes to it and they want certain thing and it's dangerous to have it in their car, you do not sell it. And some people will even sell but That degree of integrity is, is in in I mean no doubt what has continued your success and growth. What that seventy million was just a start, yeah. really. You know, it's continued yeah. well beyond that. So I've had people say I want three car seats, and the lads have said it is impossible to fit those car seats in your car without it being dangerous. And they've been to mother care and have bought them okay. because they don't know they haven't they haven't got a fitting or they, they never had a fitting service, and we would be doing them a disservice. We've got car seats that fit. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't like the colour, or they didn't like this, or didn't like that, whatever it was. Uh, but hopefully that you would don't just want them to say. So when, if you went back now, yeah. what would you change, or would you change anything about um, your business life, your, your your the way that you built business with family, or you know, would yeah, you change I, anything? We had we had a really really good um, program of education. I would up that program of education so that it went in deeper and the, and the people would understand why we was doing it probably better. I mean, we used to do it in, and we used to tell them, but they could be improved. There could be improvements uh, yeah, yeah. On, on everything, but small improvements. And but how about small. you and your, your, your business life or your jobs and what would you... So we go, going back now, 14 or whatever, realise school's not the place to yeah, be. Yeah. What would you do differently as, as a person or as a business? I don't know what I could have done because I had these challenges and each step of the way, I, I, never, I never thought, and I get a lot of people who um, want to come and have mentoring, but we have one session, one session only usually because they want to be a millionaire before they've got tuppence, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, you can't go from here to here. Yeah, you know, Have you heard of a thing called a ladder? You know, I'd say, to people, have you heard of a thing called a ladder? Do you get on the fifth, sixth step for a start, or do you get on the first step? And they go, well, you've got to get on the first step. Yeah, exactly. Whatever in life. But what I'm saying, just because you've got to get there, it doesn't mean yeah. rapidly go up. But on the first step, you've got to become the best at what you're doing, and then the best on the second step, and the best on the third step. There is no skipping. Yeah. You know, you can't jump up to the top step without being best at whatever. And I remember one of my mentors saying something similar, and, and I was probably equally impatient. I said, but can I not miss some steps? Yeah. Uh, and he said to me, he said, well, I'll tell you what, mate. He said, let's imagine this staircase or this ladder. He said, you can walk up it. That's the safest. He said, you can run up it and you'll get up quicker, but there's a chance you might slip. Yeah. He said, you could even run and miss a couple of steps. He said, but the more you don't want to follow it safely and, uh, and, and in a process, the higher your risk. Yeah. And you, are, you run the risk of killing yourself or at least damaging yourself. Yeah. And if you fall down, you might knock someone else behind you. So he, he, went, he extended the analogy and sort of said, Mike, why don't you just do it properly yeah. uh, and then have a solid business I, I, rather than trying to cut, cut yeah, steps? I would, I would add on to that another thing that I see, very often I see people for one hour uh, who've been in business for a little while uh, and and are just really taking off. And that's all I see them for. And probably a year later, I'll see them again. Unfortunately, I mean, I've never, uh, you know, I leave it to other people because I've got a lot to do and I leave it to other people. But I think um, one of the things you've said is, what would you do different? And probably I will do something different now because what I see is is people that come to it for an hour and I go, it's not too bad, you know, and you're doing the right things, you've got the right mentality, you've got the right products and uh, and I still say now on, you really need to come and see me every month because the people who do see me every month yeah. are the ones that we catch things quick. We push things on. We say, no, don't do this because there's a specialist who can do it easier, quicker and more profitable for you. Yeah. Um, and this is where you, you go in too fast or too slow or whatever. And in a year's time, they come and go, oh yeah, things have not gone too well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 
But if, and I suppose I'm going to push people more to come on a monthly basis like other people so, do. So yeah, so one of the things I, I do on that. So I'm and, doing them a disservice to just let them No, and, and, you know, the first one, you just, you, you, as a doctor, you might have all the knowledge of, of how to fix an issue that someone's got. But what you've got to do before you can even give them any medicine is you've got to ask them questions. You need to learn about them. You need to think, is that drug right for that person? Or it, that might fix this symptom, but what else is going on? Have I even properly diagnosed the problem? So I sometimes say to people, in that first hour, you're going to get to know me. We're going to talk about how we can work together. But I need to learn your business, your upbringing, yeah. your, the honest reality of where you are. Yeah. But one of the things I do um, is I don't take any less than six but six hours. So six months is the minimum, and normally it's a year commitment. Now, people might think, oh, that's a sales technique to try and get that. But actually, it's my brand, my time, my... Uh, I want to feel like I've done something of value. I want to know I need at least six hours, really. Yeah. And so, and, and I would recommend that. Yeah. But just, uh, and we will put the link in, but if someone wants to uh, benefit from, I mean, incredible experience, and, you know, I, I wanted to try and keep this for about 30, 40 minutes, but we could talk for hours now. But <laughs> if someone wants you to mentor them, where, what would they do? Just, they just go uh, to... Um, <laughs> Ne- NevilleWright.com. Neville uh, well, we'll, get, we'll make sure the link is put in. Um, NW at NevilleWright.com, and that's my um, email address. Brilliant. Well, I'll make sure we've got that in, in the system because I, I know there'll be loads and of it's people. A minimum of six, minimum hours, of six, six months. months. <laughs> yeah, it is because it is an injustice, really. Yeah. To and I'm uh, I give all my everything I, I give to charity, all my fees, my books, uh, the talks, <laughs> everything I give to, to give to charity. So um, I suppose is. And people don't want to spend money on mentoring, yeah, yeah, but they yeah. want the results. And, you know. Yeah, give, give me a pill to fix it. I don't, I don't <laughs> want to actually. I remember actually doing London to Paris cycle, and uh, I've forgotten my passport. I'd left it in the hotel. So, anyway, I had to dash back, and I started late. So, I was like an hour behind everyone else. I'm racing to catch up, racing to catch up. And then I catch up with this doctor who's at the back, and he's a GP from down in Cornwall, but he helps out on this. Um, I can't remember the name of the company we did it with, but this cycle ride. And uh, so I rode with him for a little while, partly because I was out of breath, and it was the first person I'd caught. And I'm chatting away to him, and I said, oh, what do you do? He said, I'm a GP. I said, oh, and you, you enjoy cycling? He said, I love it. He said, but he said, I'm actually I'm not a very good GP. I said, well, <laughs> what do you mean you're not a good GP? He said, well, I could probably get more complaints than anyone else in, in Cornwall. And I said, why is that then? Thinking he's going to be like a Howard Shipman or something. <laughs> and he says, he says, no, he says, they'll, co- they'll come in, and I'll often write on the prescription, walk an hour a day yeah. or, or um, stop drinking yeah. or stop smoking and they get really angry he said they said this is this is this this is stupid this is offensive and he said and I'm trying to help you here yeah. I can give you a drug but you're going to keep smoking that's not going to help you, and actually let's say you're depressed you're depressed because you're never leaving the house you're sitting home watching Jeremy Carr waiting to die for God's sake <laughs> get out get some fresh air see what a wonderful world we live interact with some some um, uh, nature and get some movement in your body uh, but that's so true that what he said then is they just want me to write a prescription for a tablet that's going to make it all okay Yes. and in business and in life sometimes people want that quick fix that instant solution um, but it's interesting you say about charity as well for I mean even when we had no money Jules and I had this superstitious belief that we've got to give 10% of everything we earn in any year income from anywhere it comes from 10% to charity so we've got the Green wow. Family Charitable Trust and and I believe almost superstitiously the old prime in the pump with, yeah. which a lot of people don't realise you have to put the water in to you get do. water out because you have you to do. expand the thing but I think if I don't keep giving I won't keep getting Yeah. Uh, and so you know part one of my roles that, that uh, uh, I, uh, I do community stuff like chairman of chamber of commerce for people in stanford but also i'm an ambassador for cambridge children's hospital and we're trying to raise a hundred million pound and that will be one of the best children's hospitals in the world because the, the themes are whole child whole life whole family whole world and and it's so simple but that whole child is do you know that if you have mental health issues and physical health issues, you can't get that dealt with in the same hospital currently. So you have to go to this hospital that, and then you have to go and see a psychotherapist. But the child is confused. They, 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 they've connected with you as a doctor. Yeah. So it's making sure that can all be done in one hospital. Oh, right. The whole life is, at the moment, you could have been treated since being born. The minute you're 18, sorry, you've got to go to the NHS now because mm. you're not a children's hospital anymore. Right. But no, we'll stay with the child till, for as long as yeah. it needs to be. Uh, whole family, one of the biggest issues for families with children is 
that mum, let's say, or dad chooses to go down to Great Ormond Street to spend time with My sister experienced this with her, right. who sadly isn't with us anymore. But she'd go down, but she'd leave two kids behind. Those kids would resent a little bit, and then they'd feel bad about resenting it because they knew Josh needed time. He deserved the time. He wasn't well. She'd feel this separation from her kids. I've got to leave them. I've got to go down. She couldn't afford the train fare. So it's about bringing it into the community and saying, do you know what? They've got kitchens where the whole family can bake cakes together. Right. They've got gardens where they can go in and the siblings and the mum and dad, they can plant plants. It's beautiful. Uh, and, and the plans are just fantastic. They've got a school there kind of thing. So then it's a whole family. And the whole world, with the wonder of Zoom and, and Microsoft Teams and stuff like that, you can have a consultation with someone in Canada, Bangalore, Australia, uh, the best person in the world to treat your child. So it's a great, I'm, I'm so excited. And we've learned from and benefited from all these other children's hospitals saying, what would you do differently? What could we do better? How can we yeah. be best? Yeah. Uh, and so, but, but part of that, I, it's not just about wanting to give and this superstitious belief. Uh, you'll know there is something really, and I say this and I'll explain myself, there's something really selfish about giving. Mm. And I mean selfish in the fact that it makes me feel really good to be able to give. Yeah. And and uh, I was asked by Coots to do a roadshow on philanthropy. And uh, I thought, well, how can I connect it to Coots Bank? Because I used to do presentations and stuff. And so I did this presentation. I thought, well, I'll try and connect it to Coots Bank. And I started studying Coots Bank. Do you know the, the founder um, ended up, uh, the granddaughter of the founder inherited the bank. Uh, Angela Bedette Coots, incredible woman. Every school child should know about this woman. She helped Charles Dickens with some of the schools he did. She helped uh, Florence Nightingale. And you can go down to Coots Bank in the Strand and see the checks written by these people and, and the stuff she did. But she famously, when she inherited the bank, said, great, we're going to do so much more for people in need. And they said, Oh, you, you can't work in a bank. You're a woman. <laughs> I've got two daughters and a, a, a mum and loads of sisters and stuff. To me, I want women to rule the world in every bit as much. But he said, you can do it. And she said, essentially, something along the lines of, well, okay then, but every pound you make, I'm going to give to charity. And she gave away the equivalent of £230 million in her lifetime to some amazing things. But um, there, there is something, and, and, and the other part I did on that roadshow was the... Uh, Warren Buffett and uh, what are they called? Bill, the Gates Foundation, which was Melinda Buffett, uh, Melinda Gates, yeah, uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett uh, are, are working with loads of millionaires and billionaires to give away a big share of what they've made uh, to help the world. Mm. But interestingly, about that, they changed the term of philanthropy and coined the term philanthropic capitalism, right. and that's about you know understanding that you'll get more out of people um, if they get something in return. They shouldn't have to. You should give because it's right to give. But have you noticed how people will, they, they won't, if you say give me £100, they won't give you £100 for a charity. But if you say come to a ball that's £100 because they're getting something, they'll yeah. go to the ball. Yeah. They'll buy a raffle ticket. I've been at auctions and, and people are even on the table sometimes. Let's say there's a train ticket to London being being auctioned. And they'll be looking up, is it worth this much? And you think, that, yeah. ain't, that ain't really what this should be no. about. It's like, no. you know, yeah. you'll get that as a bonus, but give because yeah. you want to give. Yeah. But the reality is that we give to receive. And and, and a bit like you said, oh, my, the issues you were dealing with, with ADHD um, and, 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 and the such, you said it was great, it was fantastic. To me, if you understand philanthropic capitalism, I can say, the more I give, the better I feel. Yeah. You know, I can connect with the community. Yeah. And and and, and I, don't, I believe you need to keep and, giving. And you do. The more you do give, the more you do receive. Yeah. So what's the, if there was three things you oh. could say to businessmen, businesswomen starting out, uh, uh, stalled in a business or, 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 you know, that they could kickstart their business with. Is there two or three things that oh. you would say that in your mentoring, these things come up all the time? Well, yeah, it's a, it's a bit like doing, but it's in my book and it's um, entitled Ig Piala Garam Cha. That's uh, one cup of hot tea. And it is amazing that uh, when, when a normal person comes in to a shop, uh, a normal sales staff go to them and they go can I help you and the and the person replies no thanks just look in yeah. right so eight years after starting business so I took uh, uh, my father's advice from the first day but we hadn't got the facilities we haven't got the space on the first day but it took eight years for me to after three shops to get the space to make a, a tea bar coffee bar place so we used to go up to customers and say um not not good morning can i help you but would you like a cup of tea fantastic would you like a cup of tea and they'd go uh 
how much is it? And he goes, it's free. It's, and you, it's free. You know. Um, and all, well, it's pretty good. Or, that, or the guy would say, oh, no, I don't want one. No, we go to the lady, would you like a cup of tea or coffee? Um, yeah, I wouldn't mind. And the guy would say, well, if you're having one, I will. You yeah, know? Yeah. And, if, and if it all failed and they've got a kid, you'd say, Do you, are they, are they, Mum, are they allowed to have an orange juice and some biscuits? It's all free. And they go, yeah. And well, in that case, we'll have a cup of coffee. And, and they've got no chance if they say, no, the kid takes a biscuit. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, so that, and then they would come to us because they'd have the cup of tea in their hand and they'd be going yeah. around and they wouldn't understand what they wanted, what they was going to buy, and they'd come to us and they'd so, say, can you help me with it? So that encompasses sort of giving to gain, <laughs> yeah, giving. Uh, ignoring the masses and doing something different because yeah. it's better, because yeah. can I help you? I mean, it's asking a no question, yeah. isn't it? So yeah. That's great. Any, so, any other tips? Yeah, so I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Is there two or three tips? Oh, yeah. uh, well... That's because I've taken you past 20 yeah, minutes. Yeah, two or three <laughs> tips, yeah. Well, and, and t- in, in, or things that come up regularly in your mentoring. Yeah, that you use. just like, are you are a... Well, ask yourself questions. You know, you go, you, you go into a, any place like a restaurant or anything. But mm. ask yourself what you want. All the things, all the systems, what we put in. Can um, this a job? Whatever job it is, um, can we do it quicker? Can we do it easier? Do we have to do it <clears> at all? And I'll give you, I'll give you one that bought a Ferrari for nothing, right? This my Ferrari cost zero, brand new. Whatever it, I don't know how much it was, 170 grand, nothing it cost me, nothing in comparison. So I was walking through the warehouse, we just put a new system in, uh, scanning, pick and pack scanning. And um, this guy had got, uh, well, there was about six of them back in, they'd got a whole uh, bunch of um, envelopes. So every box, every product, they used to stick this thing on and inside was an A4 sheet with the person's order. Stick it in, fold it into four, stick it in. Right, okay. Um, what, why, why are we doing that? Well, we've always done it. We've always done it. So what you always do yeah, yeah, in the yeah. past doesn't mean you've always got to do it. So we developed this system where it was scanning, so we didn't need the, we didn't need a packing note. Up to then, three thousand packing notes a day was manually looked at and manually got. But once we did that, we didn't need that sheet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We didn't need that envelope. We did, so that's 28 pence that cost me for the envelope, for the sheet, and the time to, to do it. 28 pence, right? 3,000 times a day, right? Jeez. And then there was one or two people rang and said, uh, I normally get orders from you. I get a packing note, but there is no packing note. You forgot to put it on. And the girls on the, on the telephones would say, no, there's no packing note because you've already got it on your computer. They go, what do you mean? You put the order in, yeah, everything yeah. is there on your computer. If you want to marry it up and you've got t- 20 items, and marry it up to your computer. And if need oh, be, right. she can email them another copy. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, but they've got it on their computer <clears throat> and they go, oh, sorry, we'll put it down. <laughs> 28 pence, 3,000 times. Work that bought that, you a Ferrari. That out. Yeah, it was a free Ferrari. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so that's, you know. I, I know you, you, you gave me a deadline, and in 10 minutes you've got another mentor. In I session. have. I uh, have. <laughs> listen, Nev, I really appreciate your time. And I, I hope we can come back again, because yeah, I know anytime. that you can teach us so much. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we've put the links on for Neville's book. We'll put the links on uh, for mentoring with Neville, which is, is worth its weight in gold. Like, subscribe, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks very much.